I don't know if anyone else is going to brave the rain today, so <laughs> we might as well get started. Let's see. Okay, well, today we're going to be talking about some of the more ethnic fruits that we sell. Um, jujubes, mulberries, and persimmons. We'll do them alphabetically. So jujube, which is probably the least common still of these fruits, um, and all these are deciduous fruit trees. In fact, all three of these, just to note, do not need winter. So they pretty much drop their leaves and go to sleep in the winter, but they don't really need a winter to operate. We've seen them during the last uh, five years of uh, low chill winters and all three of these the less winter we have the sooner they wake up and the better they produce so they don't apparently need the cold at all to operate uh, in fact the warmest winter of the ones we had 20 I think it was 2014 uh, most of these were in growth in January that year they just started growing. It was so warm in January, they just started growing and started, and jujube started blooming at that time. So anyway, jujube, also known as the Chinese date, it's kind of a one-of-a-kind fruit that's in its own genus. Uh, no other fruit trees related to it. There's some plants in California that are distant relatives, coffee berry, but we don't really eat that, uh, and some other distant relatives in Italy or in the Mediterranean area, but this is the one that has fruit that are edible. They do look like dates, which is why they call them a Chinese date. Picture in the book here. They're about, the commercial varieties are about the size and shape of a chicken egg, maybe slightly smaller. Uh, most of the ones sold around here are smaller than that. So they'll be the size of kumquats, jelly beans sometimes, marbles, big marbles. But the biggest ones we sell would be the size of chicken eggs. They're green until they're totally ripe. Usually they're, they get a, a nice mahogany brown color to the skin. A very thin skin, you eat the skin and all. Um, generally we like to eat them before they turn totally mahogany or brown colored. Once they do that they're, they get a little dry and mealy. But uh, right when they're about half green, half brown, they have kind of a similar quality to a good apple with a very tender apple. Uh, Apple-like flavor, about two to three times sweeter than apples. So they said jujubes were originally processed for the sugar content, and they're still used today as you know dried jujubes for their as a sweetener in uh, certain dishes and desserts. Originally in China, they said they were used for medicinal purposes. Um, there are some really tart jujubes out there. Uh, apparently a lot of vitamin C perhaps, so they were used for medicinally originally. And we do like them. They're, they have one seed in the middle normally, uh, then you eat the rest of the fruit, kind of like you would eat a date. So, And they ripen in the fall, usually um, earliest you'll see it as late August, most of them October, September, late September, October. So fall ripening. The jujube trees are quite attractive on top of that. Uh, typically, the, the new trees are upright. The growth is more horizontal. And the branching, the new branches tend to have a slight zigzag to them as they grow and they tend to hang. So you get this beautiful little weepy tree maybe 10 by 10 is what you see in most people's gardens. They can grow double that, but most people keep them cut around 10 feet and a nice zigzag look to them. The 
probably the disadvantage of jujubes in this area is they don't wake up until it's very warm. So on some years, we've seen them wake up as late as May or even June if the spring is cool. And they tend to go to sleep quite early in the fall. And we've seen them go to sleep totally in October if the fall is cool. So they do have uh, a need for warm weather. And if it's not, they just drop their leaves and go to sleep. Now, the one other thing interesting about jujube trees, it's one of the few fruit trees that will grow uh, flowering wood and fruiting wood on first-year growth. So in Afghanistan or some of the poorer countries, um, so there are different jujubes native from throughout southern Asia. Uh, we happen to grow the Chinese one, but there are other ones in Pakistan, Afghanistan, even some uh, toward the Middle East. But th they use the entire tree. So uh, they said the farmers there sell the, you know, maybe 20 pounds, 30 pounds of fruit per tree in the summer, late, late summer, early fall. And then they said right after that, they strip the leaves off to feed to their cattle. Now, truthfully, Jujube trees tend to drop their leaves soon after the fruit harvest is done, so it's not that bad for the tree. And then they cut the trees down to a stump and sell the wood for firewood after it ages. Um, and the trees regrow from a stump and flower and fruit again. Uh, no other fruit tree we know really does it that well. So we tried it one year. We, in my backyard, we had a 10-foot uh, jujube tree. And we cut it down to 18 inches just to see what would happen. And by July of the next year, it's back up above our head in flowers and in fruit. Well, flowers that were making fruit. So uh, quite unique that way. No other fruit tree we know of, you can cut that short and still get a crop on it. Well, I don't think the tree wants you to cut it down, but no. you can cut it down and it still produces fruit, which is very unusual. Uh, you, know, you do that to a plum tree, you never get anything. <laughs> so, uh, uh, yeah, they fruit on new growth, which is, which is quite unusual. So, The other thing about jujubes, um, they are partially self-fertile. The older books say that they are self-fertile, but they're not fully self-fertile. So if you only have one jujube tree, you tend to get about 20 to 30 percent of the full crop. At least that's what we've seen. So we questioned the books, and now all the books do say uh, partially self-fertile. So it's if you want to get a full crop, you need you either need to do two things: have two different cultivars, two different name varieties in your garden, close together, or um, they're grafted onto seedling rootstock, and the interesting thing about the roots of jujube trees is they sucker terribly, but the suckers bloom immediately upon emerging from the dirt. So if you let a few of your suckers grow, then they will pollinate the top of the tree, and you'll get a good crop on top. don't need to. It always makes suckers. That's the one bad thing about jujubes is they sucker a lot and the suckers bloom when they're like two or three inches tall. So they're real unique that way. I mean, the suckers bloom really quickly. So so the books probably would were saying that they were self-fertile because on farms they probably didn't control all the suckers. Because in my own yard we found out that they're partially self-fertile because we cut off all the suckers religiously and got very bad crops compared to the trees at the store, which we had about four or five varieties in stock. Uh, so you definitely need to, to be pollinated with genetics that are different than your own, and the rootstocks are uh, genetically different from the top. So their their flowers will help pollinate the top of the tree. Is there any favorite um, pollinator to go with a lee or, you know, that match to it? Just not a lee. Yeah. So, uh, no, not that we know of. They haven't really done much research with the pollinators yet. Or at least we haven't, they haven't told us anything. So, so the main thing with pollinators, you want them to bloom at the same time. 
Most jujubes bloom for several months. Uh, they don't have a real short bloom period like some peaches do, so <clears throat> so you, we don't worry about it too much. You just get two varieties of jujubes or let the suckers grow on one plant and you've got it. What varieties do you carry here? We'll go over that. Um, so pruning wise, nothing unique because you can prune them any way you like. You'll still get fruit. Just don't go below the graft. So these trees are grafted. Now, the, the three plants we're talking about today are quite expensive. They're the most expensive plants that we get in. And one of the reasons jujubes are expensive is the way they have to graft them. So most fruit trees are bud grafts. That is, in order to make a new tree, they grow the rootstock. And in the rootstock, they will insert one bud off the branch of a tree and grow a new tree from that. Uh, jujubes apparently aren't that easy. So they have to branch, have to graft a branch to it. So this section here is what they grafted. So about a three-inch section of branch, they actually had to graft on top of the rootstock, which is which means you can't you can't get that much budwood from one tree. You have to grow a lot of mother plants to get enough budwood to graft a bunch of trees. So most fruit trees, yeah, one single bud can make a new fruit tree. On jujubes, you have to take a piece of branch, which might include about three buds. Or, pardon? Looks as though that's what they're using on this, but I'm, I'm not an expert on that. But anyway, uh, so it takes a little more effort for them to, to create a jujube tree. So we sell them for uh, the, the bare roots for $59.99. In fact, everything here, the bare roots are the same price, $59.99. They're quite a bit more than the other, uh, the other, the other uh, types of fruit trees. Now the jujubes that we have, and as far as we know, the ones that we carry, the, the trees look pretty similar. Uh, we've had a few different ones in the past, few that were um, different looking, but most of the trees, it's real hard to tell them apart. And the other nice thing, because they are, they bear fruit on new growth, they usually typically bear fruit the first year, not a whole lot, because they're, they don't have much strength yet, but uh, they typically always bear fruit the first year. So, okay, the varieties, the two that were brought originally from China to California, probably in the 1800s, I think the 1800s. It was brought over by, um, I can't remember the botanist's name, but he brought Li and Lang from China. And Li is still real popper. Lang has kind of fallen by the wayside. Li makes fruit close to the size of an egg and almost the same shape. One, again, one seed in the middle. Um, the older plants make bigger fruit, so usually it takes about two or three years to get to maximum fruit quality. Uh, Lang was a sl more slender, but we don't carry Lang anymore because it didn't ripen well off the tree. In other words, you have to pick lang when it was totally ripe. In some years, uh, the langs that are stored just didn't have any flavor at all. If the summer was cloudy, so we gave up on the lang. Stay with the Lee. Lee is uh, the number one seller in in uh, in the U.S. They do appreciate hot climates. We notice that when you grow them in the interior valleys of California, you know, like San Joaquin Valley, Riverside. The fruit is uniformly big. Near the coast, you don't get as big a fruit, but you still get some years. You know, we you get some nice hot weather, you get some big fruit. So the hotter the weather, the larger the fruit gets. The more water you give them, the better. It's also, the trees are drought tolerant, but not they don't produce that well and that good a size of fruit if you don't water much. And uh, a lot of water doesn't seem to hurt them. So at my own my last house I lived at, we had our jujubes often sitting in a wet spot during the winter 
didn't seem to bother them much at all. So Lee is still one we do. One of the newest ones we just got in is called Shang C Li. And they tell us it's supposed to be about 50% larger than Lee. We have not seen them get this big yet. Uh, last year was the first year we had them on real small trees. The fruit was about the same size as Lee. But we'll see if they get bigger now. We're not sure um, if these are truly two, hopefully they're truly two different plants. Because we heard that Li is from the province in China called Shaanxi. So hopefully these two are different plants. Uh, but we'll, 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 I don't know, we'll see in the future how they do. And then the other ones that we carry, um, fairly recent, one called Honey Jar. Uh, a lot of our customers tell us this is the sweetest, it does taste like honey, but unfortunately the fruit is about the size of a large marble. So it is one of the smaller fruits out there. And then uh, sugar cane, which is also very sweet. Now jujube is really high in sugar. Um, they say they're usually more than 20%, which is very, very sweet. So I don't really personally go after the sweetest ones. I like the bigger ones just because you get more to eat there. Uh, sugar cane is a little bit more kumquat shaped. Kind of, they call it med small to medium, bigger than honey jar. And then uh, the newest one we just got in is Chico. Chico State. Northern California is one of the breeding areas for uh, jujubes. Um, in previous years, we've had one. Don't have it this year. Couldn't get it, but we'll probably have it next year again. GA-866 never got an official name out of Chico State, but that was a very, very sweet one in its day, about that size and shape. Chico is kind of apple-shaped. medium size. I haven't eaten that one yet. That's brand new this year. We'll see. Well, we don't know how it compares. Generally, if the university releases it, it's got to be something different. Oh, I think they said it had a little more tangy flavor because most of the jujubes are sweet and not much else to go for it. Uh, Chico, if it's got a little bit more acidity to it to make it sharper flavored, might be interesting but we'll see on those. Now, if you go to farmer's markets in the late summer, early fall, you'll often get dried jujubes. Uh, to me, they taste exactly like dried apples, but a little sweeter. I'm not a fan of them. Uh, I do like them fresh off the tree better. Again, that's when they're still partly green, uh, mostly brown, they're at their best. Once they turn totally brown, they often lose a lot of water. Any questions about jujubes? Yeah, I, I haven't seen any good references on how to prune jujubes other than, you know, in some parts of the world they just stump them. So in my own yard, I started stumping mine every winter, and I like the results because it seems to make them more vigorous with more new growth. But I, I haven't done any research to prove that it's better for the tree, that makes more fruit, or I don't know, it looks good. So I like to cut them hard. Now, uh, be aware, new growth on jujubes, especially when they're young, has very sharp spines on it. Um, when my kids were younger, I cut off all the spines on the trunk and didn't cut the trunk again so that the trunk would be relatively safe to handle. 
for the little kids, but uh, the new growth is spiny. On the older trees, though, we don't see any spines. So as they mature, the spines tend to go away, but there's a lot of sharp spines on here. So be careful with that. What about They've done well in pots. Uh, they don't mind the heat. Uh, you know, the one problem with containers is the the soil in the ground usually doesn't break 90 degrees, but in containers it can be ho much hotter than the air temperature. But the jujubes don't seem to mind that. They they seem to like it hot. I mean, they're from you know that area of the world where they're from is hot. So, uh, and they grow these out, you know, they said the main area to grow them is Fresno, but they love the climate around Las Vegas. So, uh, they can take pretty darn cold in the winter. So, a good plant for the desert areas, apparently. Yes? No, no, I mean, you don't know what you got from your relative, huh? <laughs> Which I, I kind? I don't know what the variety yeah. is, but it grow a lot every year, but yeah. it's very small. But, uh, yeah, I know the, the yeah, so the, yeah, don't know, because there's a lot, there's a lot out there, because the seeds will sprout. Uh, most of the seedlings have small fruit about the size of peas. And even the, the suckers that come out of the ground that make little tiny pea-like food, I eat them. They're still, they've got, usually they're pretty sharp flavored. Usually they're very tart and sweet. So quite interesting, the, the little uh, fruit off the suckers. So. No, not that I know of. Yeah. Yes. Don't know. You know, I haven't. Uh, I haven't grown all these at one time. I mean, I, I, I like. Still, we recommend Lee the most. But the Shang Si Lee is intriguing because it's bigger. But the smallest ones tend to be the sweetest ones. So it, you know, uh, it just depends what you want in a jujube. I, I like the size. I don't need more sugar. They're all sweet. They're all much sweeter than apples. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they are, they do like someone else's pollen. They don't like their own pollen as much. So if you have two together, different kinds, they'll they'll fruit more. At our house, I would say, oh, you want them close. If you're going to pollinate plants, they got to be the next plant over. So uh, say just a few feet, really. If they're much farther than two or three feet, the bees may not go. Oh. So they found out on farms that, you know, they used to tell farmers they have to be within 25 feet. Well, the farmer said, that's not working. They don't see bees go from a tree over here to a tree over here 25 feet. It just doesn't work. But if you have enough room for growing the roots, the roots will be too crowded? Mm, no, roots grow, roots on trees generally grow 50 foot or more long. You can have trees 50 feet apart, and those roots will still be crossing, so it doesn't matter. You just put them close together and grow them as one tree even. So. Oh, yeah. So, you know, the instructions we get, not any closer than 18 inches. So you can put them 18 inches apart, make it look like one tree with two trunks. That's fine. You'll have to experiment. I don't know which is the best for you. <laughs> I would probably do Lee and Shang Si Lee myself. I like them big. But uh, you may not like those two. So. Sure. Lee and Honey Jar may be a good combination. Uh, our customers told us Honey Jar. I mean, 10 years ago, it was GA866 was the sweetest. 
but uh, it appears now that honey jar actually tastes like honey. It's really sweet. So, but it is small. I mean, it is small. No bigger than your thumbnail, really. So, very small fruit. Okay. Now, uh, one note. Jujubes aren't all that reliable bare root, so they do seem to have some trouble. If a lot of times people plant a bare root jujube, and this was this is a bare root that we just put in a pot. The first year you get like two or three inches of growth, and the second year you get two more inches of growth. Uh, that usually means the roots are not growing properly. You don't have enough nutrients coming up to get more growth, so it, it can be a problem. We do get some bad trees from our suppliers occasionally. One of the reasons they're expensive is because they're uh, difficult. I think they're difficult to get the roots out of the ground. The roots are so slender and long on these, I think they just snap off. They lose a lot of trees. They're from an arid climate, so the soil doesn't seem to matter. I mean, we grow them in our potting soil, which is acidic, and they do fine, but, uh, um, yeah, they're, they're, they're native to a climate kind of like ours, so. so. Yeah. Yeah, they don't like compost in the ground. If you have uh, a good sandy soil, they'll grow in sand. Um, but our potting soil, our top pot, or our acid mix is fine for them. But uh, they do not like compost in the ground. On top is fine. Okay, mulberries. Now, mulberries are native throughout the northern hemisphere. I think even parts of the southern hemisphere have it, but there are some mulberries native to North America. Uh, the mulberries we do the most with are native to China um, in the Middle East. So there are some from uh, Western Europe and some from Eastern Europe that are the most popular now. Um, the most common mulberry around here would be the white mulberries. Now mulberry trees, there's male and female, so most of the mulberry trees you see used as street trees are male white mulberry trees. They make flowers but no fruit. And there's so many of them around that if you want fruit, you just get a female mulberry tree. You don't need the males. There's so many mulberry trees throughout North America, probably, that they'll all, the pollen always find your, your female tree. Now, white mulberries uh, tend to get big. If you see them, you know, the, they grow them all at the elementary schools because they need the foliage to grow their silkworms to show off how insects... Um, have life cycle changes, egg, caterpillar, pupa, and then the adult moth. So they use the mulberry leaves as a food for that. So most elementary schools have white mulberry trees, the male ones, uh, and they tend to grow very large. So the typical white mulberry tree tends to grow very large very quickly, 30 to 50 foot tall and wide. So that's one thing about mulberries that they can get out of hand if you allow them, because they can, especially the ones in the white mulberry family, can grow 20 foot in one year. They really haul. And the more you cut them, it seems the faster they grow. So that's one thing about mulberries, uh, at least the white mulberry. Now, the one white mulberry that we center on to carry is called the Pakistan. So it's a cultivar of white mulberry that's very popular in parts of the world. Uh, this is a photo of the fruit. 
and the fruit uh, look like red worms hanging off the branches. They there's different colors, so uh, most commonly they ripen dark burgundy red, but there are some white ones that ripen kind of a chartreuse pale greenish yellowish color. Uh, and there's some that's supposed to be close to black also. But uh, they're very long, so the um, Pakistan mulberries on a mature tree, the fruit itself can grow four inches, five inches long. Four inches is probably most common. Um, the other thing that's unique about this one, very sweet, and it doesn't stain things. So if you have the black versions of the white mulberry with the regular round fruit, uh, very staining on pavement below it, uh, and when the birds get to them, like we had a black a black fruited white mulberry in our garden, and the birds would just eat the fruit, sit on the walls, and poop all over your walls and on your furniture, and everything in your yard would have this black cast to it after a while. So we got rid of that tree, but the Pakistan mulberries don't have the staining quality to their fruit. Now this year we weren't able to get any bare roots, so we, during the summer, we bought in some liners, which were only this tall when we got them, and we've been growing them. Uh, this is the runt of the litter. It only made it to about two feet. Most of them have now grown to almost three feet. Um, not quite sellable yet. We'll probably hold on to these for another probably till mid-spring. They should start taking off and, and get some size to them. Probably will not bear fruit this year, maybe not even next year. It depends on how hot, you know, if the summer's really hot and they get some size to them. Usually when the trunks reach about finger thickness or maybe more, uh, eh, inch, inch caliper. So that'll be bigger and thicker than your thumbs. Um, then they start making fruit. Now the thing about white mulberry family is they wake up very early. So we've seen the white mulberries wake up in December. You know, if we have cold in the fall, it knocks the leaves off. And we get any heat at all during the winter time, they'll just wake up and start blooming. And then that crop will ripen fairly early, about April. Um, now, if you leave them alone, they only make one crop a year. We found out that you can make these things crop over and over and over. So the key to it is, you know, so you let them make their first crop, the crop's off, they're full of good mature leaves. At that point, they have a lot of growth buds ready to pop again. If you take off all the leaves on a branch, the, the branch wants to refoliate since the weather's warm. You know, they don't do it when the weather's cold, but when the weather's warm and there's no leaves on it, they want to make new leaves. Well, in order to do that, they got to bloom it again. So they'll bloom and make another set of leaves uh, and another crop. And we've been able to do it three or four times on one branch on a mature tree. Now, the young trees, you pick the leaves off, they'll just stay dormant until the next year. But on a mature tree, there's so much energy in that branch that those buds just pop right open, make another crop, another set of leaves and you can go all year long. We don't usually recommend stripping the entire tree at once just in case it's not mature enough but you can take off all the leaves in one branch at a time and get plenty of fruit coming off the regrowth on that branch. We found this out because uh, a person bought a mulberry tree, didn't like the fruit, pulled it out of the ground, brought it back to us, uh, we put it back in a pot, the tree defoliated from the shock and then it bloomed again, and it made another crop. We're going, oh, this is interesting. So we don't recommend pulling them out of the ground to put them in a shock. You just strip the leaves off, and then they'll, they'll open up a whole new set of flowers if the plant's strong enough. Mm, only the white mulberry. Only the original white mulberry is easy that way. The other mulberries are difficult. This Pakistan, which is this a cultivar of the white mulberry, is not can be done that way, but it's they don't all take. 
Like the easy ones are figs and grapes. Stick a branch around, they grow. But mulberries, which are related to figs, uh, not quite as easy. And the black mulberries are supposed to be very difficult that way. I mean, you can do it, but their roots are just grow real slow. But the white mulberries, yeah, white mulberry, the original white mulberry with the small white fruit, um, you take a piece of stem, stick it around, thing grows. So that's how they make the root stalks for most of the other mulberry. So I'll pull this mulberry over. This is um, a black mulberry that's grafted onto a white mulberry trunk. So this trunk was grown from a cutting. And then they grafted the black one on top because the black ones are difficult to grow from cuttings. But even a lot of the Pakistan mulberries, they will graft onto a white mulberry trunk. It's just easier uh, to grow the original white mulberry as rootstock and then grow the Pakistan on top of it. Although apparently Pakistan can be grown from cuttings. This this was grown from cutting too. So. Right. So we have the Pakistan white mulberry, and then we do have one left. No, I don't have it this year. The regular white mulberries with the white fruit. So the white mulberries, the fruit does come in all colors. White being real common, but they do. There are some black-fruited uh, white mulberry trees. Some red-fruited ones like the Pakistan. So there are different colors in that. <clears throat> and generally they're considered sweet fruit. <clears throat> they don't have much tartness to them. They're just sweet. Well, that's not true because the black mulberry, the black white mulberry I had was, uh, had some tartness to it. So then we have the family of the black or Persian mulberry. which is the one that has more of a blackberry flavor. So that's this one. We couldn't get any uh, bare root plants. Uh, unfortunately, our main bare root supplier, Mulberries, went out of business last year. So our quit growing um, large trees last year. Uh, you stop training it up, all the branches just come out and hang back down again. So very 
uh, unique look, and they actually look more exciting in the winter when you can see the branching than they do in the summer when they look like a big pile of green leaves. But the weeping mulberries tend to grow about, you know, they'll arch up a little bit and come back down, so you'll get something 8 foot, 10 foot. If you have a long, you know, if you wait a long time, maybe 12 foot by about the same width. Now, they, if you go to almost any uh, large-scale children's garden, like at Huntington Gardens or uh, even at, we saw these at Disney World, um, planted for the children's garden because in the summertime, kids can climb underneath this. You know, usually it's, as the tree gets older, you have a bigger space inside. It's like a little teepee. So you can hide in there. A friend of mine has one of the fruiting ones up in the canyon here, and about four or five people can stand underneath it and eat the fruit from the inside. So it's kind of a fun little tree to have. It doesn't get that tall. The fruit on the weeping uh, um, mulberry is quite small, maybe half an inch. Quite tasty. They're black. So this particular specimen is the male. So this one doesn't make fruit, but the female looks the same and has small fruit, and you can make it crop more than once a year. Now, I didn't mention the black Persian mulberry. The black beauty has fairly large fruit, about uh, a little over an inch in size. And it does taste a lot like blackberries. These have a nice, pretty good blackberry flavor, too. They tend to, uh, the branches on the inside tend to die from lack of light over time, so you just clean it out, and they'll just keep on arching over the top and heading down to the ground. So. Is there any special pruning techniques you use for the other Persian mulberries? Just prune them to shape, basically. Well, in, a, in my house, we took a chainsaw to ours twice a year to try to keep it under control. That's the main thing with with the Pakistan. It just hauls. It just, you know, we've seen them grow 10 feet in a couple months. So uh, it's a struggle to keep them down in height. You can per certainly put them in a pot and that'll stunt them. But if you want to see how much fruit they can make, you put them in the ground. It, it is pretty amazing how much fruit that this one of the Pakistan mulberry and one of our customers told me that that he was selling his fruit to a local Persian market because they really liked the fruit on this tree. And he was making $100 a year just selling fruit. Um, so he was, he was real pleased with the tree himself because they really like it. I mean, generally the problem with mulberries is the fruit's so delicate, the skin's so tender, you can't pick it without breaking it. This one you can. Uh, the fruit's not quite as juicy, but the other mulberry, you pick the fruit, you're, it's, it's just crumbling in your hands. So, it's like blackberries. Oh, I'm sure they're good as, in, as juice. <laughs> yeah. Yes. We bought one uh, mulberry. It was so beautiful. It was here two years ago, I think, 2017, the end of 2017. It's already there as fruit, and we take home in the pot, it is still growing some more. But then we transplant to a big whiskey pot. Mm -hmm. I don't know it, what's wrong. So grow well, but do not root in at all. Last hmm. so don't know. Uh, unless it was cut too hard. We have, you, they do, these do fruit on year old growth. So if you prune it too much, you won't get any fruit. No, we didn't do anything to it. Oh. We did not cut. Even one leaf. Uh, don't know. Don't know. Check the roots. Occasionally, mulberries will get nematodes, and if the roots are knotted up, then you'll, then that could that could sap their energy, so they couldn't fruit. But I don't know. Is That's. It, it, do you give too too, weight, too much water? No. No, too much water shouldn't hurt them. Is that okay to plant in the pot? Is yeah. it too small? No. Nope. The no fruit in pots. Whiskey pot. Yeah, half, half barrel is fine. That that should work well. Yeah, my, my own plant at my house was in a big pot for many years, and then it rooted into the ground and took off. But in a pot, it fruited very heavily. So, so should I cut the leaf 
Yours still has leaves from this last year? You could. Yeah, you can strip the leaves off. That'll help it to, to bloom out, to start growing. Should we prune it? Because we never did. It's a grow, yes, much bigger than two years ago. Yeah, generally with with mulberries, you can cut them back. So if they grew, say, this year, um, six feet, you can cut off five and a half of that, and they'll still they still make new branches that have fruit on them. I mean, we we yeah, because we cut our our Pakistan mulberry back. You know, from it would be about 20, 20 foot tall. We cut it down to about four or five feet, and it would still produce really heavily. Now, if you don't prune them at all, it would produce way more. But we couldn't reach the fruit on the top branches, so most years we would prune it heavily. <laughs> so should we cut all the branches or just part of them and then from well, I mean, if you want to get fruit, don't prune it at all. If you're not getting fruit, just don't touch it and see what happens. Because the less you prune it, the more fruit you should get. All we do, the only reason for pruning is to keep them short. That's true. Eventually, you'll have to prune. <laughs> Well, you have to cut them shorter, mm -hmm. but you can't go past where the growth started for the year or else you're not going to get any fruit on that branch. So like this tree started from right about, I think this last year, it probably started from about here. Mm -hmm. So I can cut, well, of course, these branches are one-year-old branches too. So I can, let's just say it started from here. I want to, don't want to cut any shorter about like that. Leave, leave a, a foot or so of growth should still get fruit. I haven't really seen any literature on pruning them though, but we do know they fruit on, on year old growth. So is that good? If, since it already grows as tall, and since we put in the husky pot in the tennis court, and we want it to be low, so we just uh, trim from the top branch instead of from the lower one because it's already so tall. Well, you want to prune the, the new growth back about 80-90%, that's fine. But you got to leave some new growth. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I would imagine that it would stain. I haven't had one of those in my house, so I don't have the experience with it <laughs> to see what it does. So generally, yeah, if you want a lot of birds in your yard, plant a mulberry tree. <laughs> they love it. Birds love mulberries. Okay, persimmon. This year we're really short on persimmons because um, the two main persimmon growers in California that propagate the trees both have gone out of business in the last 15 years, not well, 10 years. The Orange County Nursery and Alley Cook were the two main producers of persimmon trees. And last year uh, we had brought in close to 150 trees and still sold out by the end of summer. So this year, so far, we've managed to find about 60. And we're having to get some really small trees in. So we'll see what we can do. We, we hardly have any bare root left at all out there to sell. So it's going to be a tough year now. Um, 50 years ago, we only really had two persimmons. The uh, flat one, which were called Fuyu. And the ones that are shaped like a top, the hachia. 
Uh, chias were sold in California or grown in California originally and nobody liked them so the farmers really backed off. This one has flesh that's incredibly astringent until it's dead ripe. So the animals won't touch it uh, and people don't either until it looks it's like jelly inside. Um, so persimmons got a bad name for that because this was found at the supermarkets and none of them were ripe when you buy them. Um, so people just said, ah, oh, can't eat this one. Now, the Fuyu, the Fuyu type persimmons are edible when they're crispy. Uh, they're fine, you can let them ripen all the way to jelly too, but they're, they're, there's no astringency in them now. The astringency is unique. Uh, like an astringent wine, it, it, it dries off your tongue. It's not slimy, it's the opposite of slimy. It's kind of, well, dry It's what you'd call it. And if you have a unripe hachi and you eat it, you just you can't talk, you can't swallow. It's like your tongue is is totally been uh, covered with dry flour, or or a powdered clay or something. It's it's real interesting what it does to you. Even though it's jelly-like inside, even before it's totally ripe, your mouth feels totally dried out. It's it's an incredible feeling. Um, so that's the astringent. Uh, there's one way, Gary, I don't know if you know about it, but if you take one of those Hitachis when it's hard, before it's right, and put it in the freezer, and freeze it overnight, and put it out on the counter, and let it thaw out, mm -hmm. it then becomes jelly, mm -hmm. and the astringency dies. Right, so, there, there are, so these persimmons came from China. There are persimmons in the eastern United States. And they would always tell you, you can't eat them until the second frost. So make sure they're nice. Uh, apparently when you freeze the flesh, it explodes all the cells inside and it destroys the astringency. But uh, I like to freeze them twice. Freeze, thaw, freeze, thaw, and then they're perfect to eat. One freezing should do it. But uh, double it uh, makes certain. Uh, so the second frost. Now in Japan... The traditional way is to put them in a sake keg, uh, so a few drops of alcohol on the stem end will ripen them overnight too. So a friend of mine would put his in a Ziploc bag, a few drops of vodka on the stem end, and by morning he says they were totally non-astringent. So that's another way to do it. I guess the alcohol must explode the cells too or do something to stop the astringency. But uh, the other thing about Hachia, is that in Japan, one of the most popular foods known is dried hot chias. That is really good. If you take the fruit, let it ripen, they have to skin it. Well, actually, they don't let it ripen. They skin the fruit when it's still hard and then uh, hang it up on the side of a bar wood barn and um, let it uh, dry without its skin on it. That's one of the finest flavored foods that you'll ever, ever eat. <laughs> um, if you haven't tried it, you know, on the internet they sell, it's, it's hosh, I believe they call it hoshigaki in, in Japanese, but it's, uh, it's like $8 a pound, but boy, it's worth it. You can get it at some of the local markets, uh, Asian food stores, you'll find dried hot chia persimmon. It is really good. I, No, they, they, they dry the entire fruit. So they will take it off the branch. So the branch is like this. They'll cut the piece of branch as a handle with the fruit attached to it, skin the fruit with an apple peeler or whatever, and then they'll hang it on the side of a barn. And once a week, they'll come by and massage the fruit to make sure it doesn't harden on you. And... So they need the flesh, and then the sugars kind of, uh, as, a, as the juice comes to the surface, it leaves the sugars behind, so it's covered with a sugar coating. But it is incredibly good. <laughs> this is the dried form of that fruit. So, anyway, sideline. So, 
both these trees slow growing they eventually can get quite large but they're, they tend to be slow growing trees they don't need winter um, most persimmons are self fertile there's one that we sell that's not but most of them are self fertile yes Don't know. How long will it take all, all the time and how often to massage it? Once a week is what they would do. It. There, there's a lot of information on the internet on how to how to dry persimmons, but uh, um, yeah, it's pretty interesting. I try to slice it and put in the you know, dehydrator, but not with, not as good. Yeah, this one's easier to do that with the fuyu and put in the dehydrator. This is because you have to wait till it's not astringent too, it makes it tougher. So, but yeah, do it the traditional way, it's really, really good. Okay, so, um, now I had the opportunity to eat the original Fuyu, so I remember when I was a kid back in the 50s, Fuyu persimmons had seeds, and they weren't this flat. So the original Fuyu persimmon, which is no longer sold, is apparently this size and shape, and usually has one, uh, maybe five seeds in the middle, a little bit of brown freckles in the flesh, uh, and that was the original fuyu. The plants we sell nowadays are fuyu type persimmons. You can eat them hard, but they don't have seeds. I do like the flavor better of the, ma of the newer persimmons because one of my friends has an orchard in Tustin and they still have an old tree plant in the 50s. It is the original Fuyu persimmon and I've eaten them along with the regular new ones and I like the new ones better. They're bigger fruit, a little juicier flushed, a little sweeter to me. But in Japan they're highly esteemed. They have a lot of folklore about Fuyu persimmons. You can't stop eating them till explode. Uh, all that kind of stuff. So they're, they're uh, well known. I mean, any Asian homeowner wants to have a persimmon tree, <laughs> so they're really, at least the, the non-astringent ones, are quite good. And they do come in all shapes, so these are all different kinds of persimmons. Uh, about half of them are astringent, half of them are not. And the original Fuyu is this one. You can see it's not real, real flat. And then the ones that uh, are sold now as Fuyu's, uh, well, this book is kind of old. They don't have the newest ones up here. So the main two Fuyu's that we sell one is called uh, Jiro, or Jiro, and the other one's Emoto. So these are two Fuyu types. Another one is Izu, but Jiro is the main one being sold. It's called, also known as the California Fuyu. So it's a large, flat, seedless Fuyu persimmon, ripens late September, early October. Well, it's supposed to put down early fall. Eh, early to mid fall. Now, my dad and I used to grow Jiro and Emoto together. And when we ate them at the same time, we always liked the Emoto better. We found out <laughs> it's not really that different from Jiro. So Emoto was found in a Jiro orchard, and one branch on one tree fruited two weeks earlier than the other one. So they cut that branch off and called the Emoto. So, it, so if you eat them together, the Emoto is always a little riper. So it turns out, yeah, it tastes better because it's a little bit riper than the Jiro. So it's usually a little sweeter, a little bit less crunchy, uh, but essentially it's the same tree. Now we have noticed, though, Emotos that we've eaten tend to be a little heavier producers, and that's prob, especially when they're young. And that's most likely because it's a sport of Jiro. Uh, 
in, when they do propagation plants, they note that, and they've done it with clones of sheep too, they notice that the clone of the original matures sexually a little faster than the original. There's something missing on the, on the clone. It, it loses its juvenile tendencies. So the Emotos seem to get into production a little bit faster than Juros do. So I've seen Juro trees go four years, no fruit, and then make a huge crop. Emotos, we've seen a lot of them produce the very first year a small crop, and very heavily in the, in the, in when it's real young. To its, almost to its, its uh, disadvantage because it's got so much fruit it can't grow. If there's too much fruit, well, I don't know. The motos I've grown have fruited every year, but uh, they can't fruit on the same branch heavily every year. But I don't know. They seem to, though. The ones I, I had one once, two fruit the first year on a first-year tree, 25 fruit the second year on a slightly larger tree, 75 fruit the third year on the, that tree. It was just crazy what it was doing, but it wasn't getting any taller than this because the fruit was just weighing it down. Whereas the Jira right next to it, three years no fruit, it got about 10 foot tall and wide, and the fourth fruit, it had like 200 fruit on it because it had some size. Whereas the Jiro Emoto was still struggling at, you know, it, it, but it made fruit every year real heavily, just couldn't grow. So, now earlier this year, we only got Jiro trees and we sold out. Uh, the grower who has never grown Emoto before, had some motos, very small ones, so we, we told them to send them to us, even though they don't like to send them to nurseries this small. Uh, this is called 3 8 inch caliper. Actually, it was 5 16 inch caliper, which is smaller than what orchards usually plant. But we wanted to get some persimmon trees because we were essentially sold out of the Fuyus totally. So we brought in the smaller motos. And hopefully by summer, these will look like something we could sell. At this point, I don't want to sell them. Persimmons are a little chancy to grow from bare root. About 10, 15% of them fail to, to leaf out, this die as a bare root plant. So we don't like to sell them that early, especially the small ones like this. We'll wait until they're well on their way before we sell them. But that's the Emoto Fuyu persimmon. Now some of the... Um, quote academia have warned us, have warned me that the Fuyu persimmons don't do well grafted to the rootstock that the growers graft them to. Well, uh, the growers have responded. They said it was the original Fuyu that they don't grow that it does, not, does not like the rootstock that they're using. The Jiro and the Moto and the Izu are not Fuyu persimmons. They're totally different genetics than the original one. Uh, we don't seem to have any problem with the root, them being, uh, with their uh, um, problem with the rootstock. Um, what do you call it? A lot of times, if they don't match the rootstock, the root, the graft fails within 10, 20 years or so. Now the Izu is another one. Uh, I believe we're sold. Yeah, we're sold out of this one for the year too. The Izu, uh, a lot of books have said, have, has, is the best tasting of the Fuyus, but you can't compare them because it ripens way too early. Uh, Izu, for us, has ripened from mid-August to mid-September. So very early ripener. A little smaller fruit, a little smaller tree, as, of, at least of what we've seen. But... Uh, in fact, we didn't even get any trees this year. We couldn't get any of the Izu trees. They didn't have any to sell. So we ordered them, uh, didn't get any. But that, we've had it in the past, and that's, so if you want uh, to extend your persimmon season, start with the Juro, and if you want them uh, earlier, Izu and Emoto's a bit earlier, too. I'm sure you could. The original one ripens the latest, but I don't, you know, I'll, well, I can ask my 
friend for Budwood off of that one if you want seeds in your fruit. <laughs> Yes. So these are the Fuyu types. Uh, there are more. Uh, there are one uh, Fuyu called a giant Fuyu. And there's several, quote, giant Fuyus. One is called Gosho, and one is Hana. Uh, we tried Gosho for 10 years. It's, it's maddening. The fruit, I love the fruit. The fruit grows, actual size is about like this, about the size of a grapefruit. They are good. They do get soft on the bottom before the top is ripe. So it's a little bit softer than the regular Fuyu's, but they're big fruit. But the problem with Gosho is it would, it would drive you nuts. I grew, the, I grew two in my backyard. They would both set about, I would swear, 200, 300 fruit. All the fruit by August was about this big and then it would all abort everything green except for maybe one or two on each tree and I did that for like five years I couldn't stand anymore I just cut the trees down and got rid of them I said I can't stand this can't stand the tree aborting fruit like that and it's known to do that now a friend of mine had one that was 20 years old it didn't abort as much fruit anymore so he was getting about 100 fruit a year on his so apparently I had to wait another 10 years for them to stop doing that abortion in the middle of summer. The Hana is supposed to do it less, but our grower never could get us a good crop of Hanas. The trees were really small and, and just uh, not making it. So uh, I don't have a supplier for either one of these right. Well, I think our, our current supplier still grows the Gosho, but I don't know that I would uh, torture any of our customers with that tree. Plus, the giant Fuyus, we tended to lose them in the pots even the second year. They would grow the first year and die the second. So more delicate plant than the uh, Fuyus or the Hachias. So there is the chocolate persimmon. Another one called coffee cake, and I believe we still have these in bare roots. And these are the ones with the brownish flesh. This is a chocolate percent from last year. Fruit is smaller. Uh, fruit tends to be shaped like this. Not much bigger than that. Uh, they have seeds inside. They have kind of a cinnamon speckled flesh. Non-astringent. Not bad. Personally, I still like the food is better but for something a little different and you can kind of imagine somewhat chocolate flavor uh, not bad the coffee cake is a much larger fruit about this size And it needs to be next to a chocolate. If you don't have it next to a chocolate, you can't eat it. I mean, I uh, I grew one of these at my house without the chocolate. I thought, boy, I've got so many other persimmons in my house. I don't need to have them as a pollinator. But apparently, my other persimmons just wouldn't make any male flowers. So the coffee cake made a whole bunch, you know, made a couple hundred fruit. Beautiful, light orange fruit this big. Not edible. Tried freesium, totally inedible fruit. <laughs> Just couldn't eat it. Without the seeds in there. Now, interestingly, one fruit was damaged by a bird when it was developing. And that one got chocolate-colored flesh and was quite good. But the rest of the ones that were not damaged while they were developing, bright orange, well, actually kind of a light orange, uh, but never could eat any one of them any of them could not eat them so you got to have it next to the chocolate to uh, to get the seeds and the edible flesh no I haven't yes It's very sweet. 
Yeah. You're talking about which one? The, 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 I don't know the question for variety. We got one sixteen. We got one last year. Uh huh. And the first one, it's very good. The first year, it's it's all get through the first year, but didn't grow at all last year. And the second one, uh, fruiting about five, but just very small or drop. So what's the what's wrong? Second one, we grow in the pot, in the whiskey pot. No, is Well, persimmons, yeah, persimmons are noted to abort a lot of their crops when they're young. Uh, so usually we say first four years you may not get anything, but as they get older, they tend to hang on to too much. So that's why we like the Emoto, because it tends to hang on to its all its fruit, but the Giro tends to abort everything for the first three or four years. They, all, they start to develop and they fall off, just the way persimmons are. So a lot of persimmons do that. They'll start a fruit and drop it because there's no seed. You know, most of these have no seeds, so they don't even want to make them without the seeds, but they're, they are seedless, so they eventually will hold on to them and make them. But, yeah, the first four years, you're not guaranteed to crop on persimmons. So... Well, we like to water them daily. Yeah, most farms uh, water their crops daily. They found that uh, watering is much more efficient if you do it lightly and constantly than heavily and... These are from Japan and west eastern China. It's a wet area. I don't, you know, I would say I've watered them a lot. I mean, I've, I've known people who don't water their persimmons much, but they're old ones. And the roots are probably 50 foot, 60 foot long. They're probably finding their water. I don't know that they're drought. You know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't tell you any fruit is drought tolerant when it's producing. So, now we do notice that when the spring is cloudy, they tend to abort more fruit. So a part of it is energy. If they don't get enough sunlight in the spring, uh, they don't think they can hold their fruit crop. They're dropping them. So, nothing special. Now, on old trees that are big, uh, so I've read some articles. Uh, there used to be an orchard down in um, San Juan Capistrano, the Bathgate Farm. Uh, I think there's a school, elementary school down there named for them, but Jim Bathgate had persimmons. Fuyu type persimmons in California for a long time, since I guess the 1930s or 40s. I think no, I think it was the 40s. So he wrote articles about pruning them, and they noted that commercially they would have you know too much fruit one year, not enough the next. Too much fruit one year, not enough the next. So they would, uh, and they said it was pretty reliable. If they had very few fruit one year, the next year they were way overloaded, and then the following year they'd have nothing. But because on the year they had nothing, the tree gained so much strength, it would be way overloaded the next year again. So he would, he, what he said is that during the year when there's no fruit, at the end of the year they would prune their branches back two-thirds so that they couldn't produce much the next year. And on the year they had a lot of fruit, they wouldn't touch the trees because they knew there wasn't going to be any fruit the next year anyway. So that's the way they prune their fuyu persimmons. So heavily on the years when there are no fruit and lightly on the years when they had fruit or not pruned at all. So, so if you have hundreds of persimmon trees, go, go at it. I don't know. I, I, hate to do much, I hate to sacrifice any fruit on any persimmon tree. <laughs> and I would just note, if you, if you want to keep the birds off your persimmons, Plant a hot chia tree too. <laughs> Once the birds try that one, boy, they do not want to eat any persimmon anymore at that point. That does help. I mean, I've seen huge persimmon trees in Santa Ana, Orange, never touched by any animal. <laughs> they just won't go out, they won't eat that stuff. It's interesting. So, uh, Barrett-wise, I just have a few chocolates. We might be out of coffee cake, too. I have a few chocolate persimmons right now. 
maybe one hot Shia left, and we will have uh, Emoto persimmons hopefully uh, late spring, early summer that we know we're going to make it. One thing about persimmons when you plant them, uh, the growers always say plant them deep. So this where the graft union is, they say to plant it up to there. Because persimmon roots are extremely sensitive to sun burning. They happen to be very dark, just about charcoal colored. And if they're anywhere near the surface, the sun gets the root and cooks it and kills the roots.